The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside. This week, we're gonna dive straight in with a microwave oven. First thing I'll say about this one, it's an otherwise straightforward, just a microwave, 800 watts. Now, if you've never given that 800 watts any thought, that is 800 watts of power imparted to the food. So this thing will draw something like 1500 watts. Now that's to drive the controls, the light, and also the inherent inefficiencies of the machine. Uh, another first for me um, is the sides of this case are actually held on by tamper-proof torque screws with the little uh, nipple in the middle. So of course you have to have the corresponding screwdriver bit with the hole. Just for an extra little bit of safety to make sure nobody inadvertently gets inside a microwave. A humble microwave is kind of a, an interesting candidate for a teardown. Everybody's got one, everyone knows what they do, but I don't suppose many people have actually been inside one. It's, it's, these days they're kind of so cheap they're almost disposable and they're, for the most part, really reliable. They don't often go wrong that you'd need to go inside anyway. But they are a wonder of technology. So let's see what they've got to offer. Oh, uh, in case it needs saying, this microwave was bought broken. I'm not destroying a microwave for no good reason. There you go, first piece off straight away. Better build quality than I'd expected already. I mean, obviously a lot of earthing going on, which is perfect, uh, but the metal work I don't know whether intentionally or incidentally is, is powder coated on the inside so there aren't any particularly nasty sharp edges already. It's a good sign, we'll carry on. There we go. So that flex will be an absolutely off the shelf item. It's bought from somewhere else. You'd probably find that identical flex in dozens of other machines. Now that's, that's clever because it means that the manufacturer doesn't have to specialise in producing lots of different region uh, specific flexes and plugs, but it also means that they're easily replaceable. You can regionalise the machine by just replacing that one part, as you've already seen, a couple of crimps on the end and that's it, they're ready to go. So the first component is this tiny little power board up here just held on with a couple of little plastic clips and looks like it's got a quick blow glass fuse in it but that's nice to know that there is a ceramic quick blow fuse in there if you have a microphone a uh, microphone a microwave that is completely dead knowing there's a little quick blow fuse in there is really useful that's probably a quick fault finding tip that most people could try at least not that I'm particularly interested in trying to fix this microwave but since we're here and presented with a reasonably discreet method of what could be the problem. There you go. The fuse has done its job, which is great, and to fix this microwave probably would be a few pennies, a few cents. Now you've got to bear in mind that that fuse blew for a reason. Now that reason could have been that somebody put something inappropriate in the microwave, or it could be because there's another fault and a new fuse would just trip again. But for a couple of pence, it's worth finding out. Uh, the other thing I will say about this teardown is this microwave has been off and unplugged for a very long time since I've had it. So I'm absolutely sure any capacitors or anything in here have discharged because I'm imagining there's some high power caps in here somewhere. Got some high voltage connections down here and a couple of smaller ones. Okay. And... This is, of course, where I'm going to slip and cut my fingers to ribbons. Let's see if I can turn that over. Get in there with a screwdriver, loosen those off. Okay. That was reasonably straightforward, actually. So, wow. Yeah, I knew there'd be a capacitor in here somewhere. I wasn't expecting one quite, quite that size. Now, a, a big transformer is not really too much of a surprise. Um, but yeah, that cap, that's gigantic. Oh, and a diode too, massive diode. Bit weird that it doesn't tell me the secondary 
side voltage on this transformer. Let's uh, remove it from the bottom tray and see if uh, there's any more information. All right, for anyone that's interested, the transformer is £8.13 or £8.14, which is just over four kilograms for just this nice, very big, high power. Um, I'm guessing this is going to be rated at probably about a kilowatt. Great windings though, they're just uh, not potted, they're ceramic coated wires. I do have this like a, a, an epoxy based tape, so once you wrap it around it'll hard, uh, expose to the air or something or harden. Uh, and you've got all the laminations for preventing eddy currents in the transformer. And that is the high voltage output connection to the diode. Um, unfortunately the high voltage leads are also correct directly connected to the transformer, but the capacitor, so the capacitor is rated at 2100 volts AC. So along with this connection back here, which was onto the, I think the center or the core of the transformer is rated at five kilovolts. So 5,000 volts. Uh, otherwise it's quite a small capacitor. Uh, it's only 0.95 microfarads. So high voltage, but low capacity. And then we've got a shunt diode, which is a 2CL3512H. That is a sizable diode. Now what this kit all drives is still in here. And that weighs significantly less with that transformer. In fact, I would go as far as to say that transformer probably made up 60% of the weight of the entire unit. Okay. Controls are coming out last. Let's get this out next. Ah, <laughs> kind of forgotten about that, but um, the motor on the bottom for turning the turntable. I suppose it's got to go somewhere, and that is mains voltage. So in my case, 230 volts, sort of. There's a backstory behind that if anybody's ever interested. And what I've just removed there appears to be the lamp holder for the internal light. Okay. And the lamp is sellotaped in. So just taking this lamp holder out, it's fed by two uh, spaded lug, lug connections. The lamp holder, this little bit of plastic is, uh, I, I don't want to call it cheap, but it's not particularly <laughs> anything special. Uh, but yeah, the lamp is sellotaped in place. I don't... Well, look at that little 20 watt screw lamp, which is still good by all accounts. There it is. That is the magic that makes the whole thing work. So you've got a through neutral connection, which is just grounding the fins at the top and a high voltage connection at the bottom. I'm going to come back to this with a bit more detail at the end. So the bit I originally said was, uh, a transformer right at the beginning when I was looking in the side uh, is actually not a transformer. It is uh, it is the stator for an induction motor. So you might be looking at this thinking that this is a permanent magnet, but if I take something metallic, it's not. Uh, this is an induction motor. So all you do is feed alternating current in. And by the time the poles are flipped in the main magnet, the induced magnet in here is opposing it. So it causes the rotation. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, if anybody would like a better explanation, I will do some writing up and decent explanation over on the Element 14 community, um, and hopefully it'll make a bit more sense. Yeah, I've got a bit of a soft spot for induction motors. Um, I, I, I feel like the electronic principles or the, the electromagnetic, the electromechanical properties of them is so clever and so useful. Um, they're just really simple, but they work. They're, they're in so many things. Um, I seem to think, remember being told once that um, it's, it's squirrel cage motors running on the consistent frequency of the AC distribution network of whatever country you're in. So in the States and Japan, 60 Hertz, in a lot of other places, 50 Hertz, is how you manage to reliably get rolled record players to spin at the same speed, even though they didn't have DC motors and uh, intelligence. It was all based on using the distribution network as a timing network. I always thought that was cool. So this is the interlock. Now there are three micro switches on here and they are literal micro switches. The one for the bottom, 
one for the top, and a third one. Right, so these interlock with the door like that. So, so top and bottom are pressed down by the door, and this one is pressed in by the door. So unless the door is properly seated, this one's going to be open. And this is interestingly uh, a two-way switch. If you want more information on switches, throws and ways, head over to the learning circuit where there are some great videos. Very, very interesting little mechanical and a great example of sort of proper industrial safety interlocks where you have the software interlocks which go to a microcontroller and stop it in a soft way, a safe way, they will go to the microcontroller and say, okay, can you please switch off the relays to the transformer? But you've also got the physical uh, interlock. So this switch is actually switching the mains voltage um, and isolating the transformer directly. So even if for some reason the software on the microcontroller crashed or broke, this switch would still kill the dangerous parts. And that's, that's a consistent theme in proper safety interfaces. Now these parts are the bit that make a microwave. If you wanted to make a microwave, this is the clever bit you'd have to know. Now, a big high voltage transformer, not too surprising. Heavy diode and a choke, again, probably quite used to seeing that sort of stuff with power regulation, especially when it comes to high voltage and high frequency. This bit, this is my favorite bit and the story behind it's almost even better. This part is a cavity magnetron. Now, the inside of this little element down here that's covered in all the fins for heat dissipation is the cavity magnetron. That's what does the work of generating the microwave electromagnetic radiation. Now, just quickly for anybody that doesn't know, microwave refers to a range on the electromagnetic spectrum. It ranges from about one millimeter in wavelength up to a meter. It covers that entire frequency. Now, this will be generating microwaves at approximately 2.35 gigahertz, which Yes, is very close to 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. It is not the same. When you bear in mind that it's 500 million away from 2.4 gigahertz in terms of frequency, all of a sudden it's, it's drastically different. So those videos that went around the internet a few years ago of people um, popping popcorn by putting phones around them on the table, never gonna work. The power output of the Wi-Fi or the antenna on your phone or anything like that is limited by the law in your country. Typically, that's gonna be about 100 milliwatts. Now, this is 800 watts of radio power output. Now, if you tried to work out how much it would take to boil a liter of water with Wi-Fi, it would take forever. This part in here is the cavity magnetron. Now, this is an incremental design on the one which was designed in World War II and fitted to aircraft as their short range radar. Uh, it was a massive technological revolution over the existing technology, which was completely land-based and wouldn't fit on an aircraft. Such a really beautiful, simple machine bit of metal is what makes the difference catching on fire and generating a specific wavelength that heats food. It's incredible engineering. Anyway, sorry I get distracted sometimes, but what we're here to see really are the electronics which drive it, which are minimal, it has to be said. Like I say, I've never taken a microwave before, apart before, uh, and I, I don't know why I kind of thought it'd be more full of stuff. It, it's very empty. The, uh, uh, the tiny PCB that actually sort of sits outside the metal case to a large degree, just got a single board on it, and that drives everything. I, I, I just thought the entire cavity that fills the microwave would be more full of equipment to make it work. It's kind of nice in its simplicity. When you think that that's for cooling, that's for lighting, that those three parts are what actually make the microwave. That's a safety interlock. And this is the brains behind the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> how's that for fault finding for you? Right, down here, we've got a trace which has decided to leave the board. So on the inside of this plastic, you've got this really telltale it looks like a sooty burn mark, but there's kind of a green sheen to it in a certain light. Now, I know from bitter experience that that's a copper deposit. Now, we come over and look at the board, particularly the bit that was just in front of there. Now, this trace on the board is just gone. So if I pull out the old Klein multimeter, uh, we should be able to check the impedance and the end-to-end -end of that trace and find that it's absolutely dead. So if I go the adjacent trace, So we're down at basically nothing. It's a dead short, which is what it should be. 
If I go to the next trace over, it's completely open circuit. So theory goes, if we wanted to try and repair this, we could put a jumper wire across there and you could repair it. Obviously, we don't still know what the fault was that caused that trace to explode. But again, that will be what took out the fuse. So on the back, we've got a mechanical relay. Yep, a mechanical 20 amp relay and another relay and again you can see the separation on the board between the high voltage side and the low voltage so you know these are going to be switching high voltage because they're on the far side and there's space unpopulated space here on the board marked up grill so this model would be have an option for a, a grill model as well and got a microcontroller which unfortunately i'm really struggling to read i'll do my best to get the data off of that and then we've got power regulation. So we've got a little transformer, some diodes, uh, four of them. I'm pretty sure they're gonna be a bridge rectifier in the position, the layout they're on on the board as well. So this will be your power quality uh, and rectification board. And again, it's quite probably on a daughter board, so this can be regionalized. So this would be these two parts, this part and possibly this part are the only two things you would need to change to regionalize this for a different frequency and different voltage. And it takes AC in at the bottom, so it's obviously high, high voltage on this edge of the board. And there's your back of your round display, which is a nice, nice custom board. It's obviously got a lot more functions than in the display than this microwave model had. And then four really unexciting tack switches a rotary encoder with a push function. If anybody's lucky enough that they've never seen one, but you don't really need all this, you do have microwaves with clockwork timers that you just close the door, spin it, and it will be physical or mechanical interlocks. Having a microcontroller is an unnecessary luxury, we'll call it. While being on the simple end of the spectrum in terms of electronics, I think there's some really interesting tips that we can take from this. I mean, electromechanical safety interlocks, the fantastic engineering behind the uh, cavity magnetron, I've really enjoyed seeing inside a microwave. If you've got an idea for a teardown you'd like to see, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside and let us know. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.